Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading, we have two of them. The first one is Hebrews 4.15, and it says, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Our second scripture reading is Romans 5.8, and it says, But God showed us his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Good morning. There's some tired folks out there. I know. Somehow this year I, uh, is it this thing? Should I bend this out of the way? Can you hear me now? Okay, we're good. Somehow this year I escaped the responsibilities of all night duty. Uh, Thank you, Pastor Zach. So I appreciate, I appreciate sleep. Sleep is the key to happiness, I've come to find out. Um, you know, today in Sabbath school, someone asked the, the age-old question, am, am I good enough for heaven? I think we've all wrestled with that before. And um, I'm going to start with a little story that I experienced back when I was in college that I still, it's, it still haunts me to this day. I, I wonder, after this experience, Am I good enough? When I was uh, probably in the 20, 21 years old, my wife, I may have shared this story before, but it's, it's worth repeating because it, it was a, a low point in my life. My wife had signed up to run the Indy Mini Marathon in Indianapolis, Indiana. It was a half marathon, which I think the last portion of it finishes, or at least a section of the race, you actually run on the, the Indianapolis 500 Speedway, the, the racetrack. And uh, so you, you actually run on the, the track. It's pretty cool. But uh, she was entering for this race, and uh, me and a couple other of my friends who were um, not in the race, um, but we went down there to support her and kind of cheer her on. And we had a couple other acquaintances that were running. And uh, we were watching the race unfold. And uh, as we were sitting there, actually we were standing along the, the last stretch as the runners were coming into the finish line. And this was a pretty pretty big race, so the, the sidewalks were fairly crowded, there were a lot of spectators, and among these spectators, there was a man of small stature, wearing rags, layers of clothes, looked like he hadn't bathed in quite some time, had the, the gloves with the, the ripped you know, holes where the fingers are coming through, and he was carrying a little, uh, looked like a little cup or a can of some sort. And on the can, it said a Bible verse or God bless you or something like that. And he was saying that over and over. He would go up to people and kind of hold the can up and say, you know, God bless you, God bless you. And uh, people were dropping dollar bills and coins and and various things of value in this little can. And at this point in my life, I had come to believe in science more than the God of creation. And I was quite bold in proclaiming myself as an atheist, although I was, as I reflect back, I think I was really more of a frustrated agnostic. Um, I, wanted, I wanted there to be a God, but I, I hadn't found anything substantial to hold on to. So at this low point in my life, being this bold atheist, this beggar came up to me, and being a young, insecure man seeking the approval of my peers and seeking laughs and smiles, as this beggar, if you would want to call him that, came up to us and he held the can up and he said, God bless you. And I looked at him and then straight in the eyes and I said, there is no God. And I turned and walked away. And it was shortly after that when God smacked me upside the head with a brother I never knew I had. And uh, he happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and shared his faith with me and uh, painted a picture of God that was substantial enough for me to claim a hold on to. Praise, praise the Lord. And uh, my life was drastically changed and, and turned around. But, but that, that instance in my life, that, that small cross-section of my 44 years of life, when I get to that part of it, I often wonder, can, can God really forgive that? I mean, 
here we have a, a man in need, and I, I don't know, maybe this man was even an angel sent to test me. And I denied him of his needs, and I denied God in his face and in God's face. And I did it boldly. And yet God still loves me. And I, I'm assured by that, by Galatians 3.28. It says, um, actually this isn't the verse I was going to read, but I'm going to read it anyway to open us up in the next part here. It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So we go back to that question, am I good enough? In, in, you know, back in the days when, before Jesus was here, you know, you had to be a Jew. A lot of people thought, you know, Jews were God's chosen people. And they were God's chosen people to declare his glory to the world. They didn't live up to that expectation very well. They kind of closed themselves out from the influencing those up around them. And uh, they kind of did a little bit of disservice to God's character and uh, God's message. Am I good enough? I, I, you know, if I'm not a Jew, am, am I good enough? If I'm not a Christian, if I good am I good enough if I have done all these bad things in my life, even though I am in the church? I have these dark secrets. I have these things that I've, I've fallen short with in my life. I have not been faithful to the duties that God's called me to do. Am I good enough? And I hate to say it, when I look in the mirror every morning, the honest answer when I ask that question, am I good enough, is no. I'm not good enough. Amen. None of us are good enough. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Interestingly enough, God loves us. God loved me back when I denied that beggar. God loved me when I denied him in the face of that beggar. God loved the foul-mouthed sailors. He loved the tax collectors. God loved the prostitutes. He loved the unfaithful. He loved the lepers and the beggars. He loved the wealthy. He loves you and he loves me. Amen. But God does hate something. God hates sin. Yes, you've, you've heard the old expression, you know, God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. There's so much truth in that. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.15, which is what uh, Sadie read this morning, I, I took this verse and combined it with Romans 5.8. You know, I'm, I take, take a little here. You know, the Bible sometimes says... Uh, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept, right? Um, kind of doing that here this morning. I think these two verses complement each other well, and they paint a good picture of who God is. And it says there, Hebrews 4.15, and then leading into Romans 5.8. And we're going to touch on these a few times. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. And I don't know about you, but I know I'm weak. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And then in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his lo own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. You know, Jesus hated it when I watched an endless. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a series of things here and, and I'll let you use your imagination. I'm speaking for us. Um, these things, some of these things might apply to me, some might not. Um, please don't judge me when I read these, okay? You know, I'm, I won't judge you because I'm reading these for you too, okay? I think God inspired me with these things, these thoughts that I, that I wrote down here. Jesus hated it when I watched an endless chain of YouTube videos and once again snuffed out my time for personal devotions. However, he has been tempted in every way just as we have, yet he did not sin. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus hates it when my cheat meals become my every meal and my health is compromised. However, he has been tempted in every way just as we have, yet he did not sin. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus hated it when I put 10,000 men on the front line knowing that they would surely die to protect the price of oil and my posh lifestyle while I masked the cause with some moral banner. However, he has been tempted in every way, just as we have, yet he did not sin. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus hated it when my secret lust on the computer screen supported a multi-billion dollar sex trafficking industry while I claimed to love my wife and children. 
However, he has been tempted in every way, just as we have, yet he did not sin. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus hated it when I secretly wished my co-worker would get fired and I would advance into his position. However, he has been tempted, being Christ, in every way, just as we have, yet he did not sin. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus hates it when I abuse my body and mind with uncontrolled passion for food, drink, money, lust, and pride. However, he has been tempted in every way, just as we have, yet he did not sin. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus hates it when I covet the rich man's trophy wife so I can bathe in the riches of materialism. However, he has, not been, however, he has been tempted in every way, just as we have, yet he did not sin. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus hates it when I hate the rich man and lust after his wife and her airbrushed silicone appearance. However, he has been tempted in every way, just as we have, yet he did not sin. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says Jesus loves the lustful. He loves the trophy wives, the men who lack self-control and integrity. He loves the godly and the ungodly alike. We have a God who has been tempted in every way, just as we have, yet he did not sin. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can I hear an amen? amen. The list could go on. The list could go on. And I'm sure some of these sting in the heart as you listen to these things. Some of these you might not relate to. But every one of us probably in some aspect or another falls under one of these umbrellas. Christ has been tempted, just like you, just like me. He was tempted by the devil in the wilderness with, with appetite and, and pride and, and power. I'm sure he was tempted all 33 and a half years he was here on earth. Yet he did not sin. Yet while we were sinners, he died for us. You know, one of the best ways to describe God's love for us is through marriage. And uh, that is a theme that you see in the Old Testament. You look at the, the Song of Solomon and that wonderful story, which may be a little... I, I, maybe you have, I think you have to be 18 to read that story, if I remember right. Um, but it is a, is a passionate love story of God's yearning for the bride and the bride's yearning for Christ. And we see it in the New Testament. God's first miracle, he made wine for a wedding feast, a great celebration of the covenant between a man and a woman. An amazing example of love and completeness. Back in, in Genesis, when God created man and woman, he created them to complement each other and to become one. Just like God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in purpose, yet three separate entities we have man and wife, they come together as two separate entities, one purpose. That's how marriage is supposed to be. And uh, I don't know about you, but I can remember back when I got married, the excitement and the anticipation leading up to that day. You know, it's, it's exciting. So much time and energy and money and planning goes into a wedding. And uh, God's planning for us to receive His bride when he comes again in those clouds of glory to take us home with him, is nothing compared. There's, there's nothing that compares to it. John 14, 2 and 3 says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, they, there you may also be. God promised that he's going to go and prepare a place for us and that he would come back and take us to be there with him. He's calling you and he's calling me to accept that invitation. It's free. You don't have to earn it. You know, they, they, say, they say that God is a risk taker. You know, gambling isn't good, but I hate to say it, God gambled when he created you and me because there was a, a risk there, right? Right? It was a, you know, I don't know what, what the percentage of the chances are, how many people are going to be in heaven and how many aren't. That's not for me to decide. But when God created you and me, and he created us with the freedom of choice, he gave us a free will, 
he knew that there was a risk and there was a chance that we would choose not to follow him and not to serve him. He knew that there was a risk that we would be lost for eternity. Yet he knows that for those who choose him, that reward is going to be so great and the bliss is going to be so indescribable that it was worth the risk. You know, I saw a sign on a church once up in northern Arizona and they had a little billboard out front, you know, worship service, the times and upcoming events and whatnot. And they had a quote that was on that sign and it said, be willing to step out on a limb because that's where the fruit is. I believe that God stepped out on a limb when he created us, but his love for what would be was so great and it was so worth it that uh, he took that risk. And it wouldn't be a shame if we weren't there. God's preparing a place. He promises to come back and take us there. The bridegroom is coming. Therefore, let us, the bride, repent and prepare ourselves for him. Revelation 19.7 uh, in Revelation 21.2, a couple of verses that describe um, preparing ourselves as a bride for the bridegroom's return, for the bridegroom's coming. Uh, I remember when my wife and I got married, the planning and the preparation that went into it, um, it was overwhelming. Somehow that, that summer when we got married, I had landed a job um, working at a factory making auto, car, like car parts and stuff like that. And my work shift was from midnight to 8.30 in the morning. And because of that, I got to sleep from about 9 in the morning until, you know, mid-afternoon. And uh, then I somehow kind of escaped a lot of the, the planning for the wedding. So that was kind of cool, actually. Um, my, my mother is, I, I love her to death, but when it comes to planning, the meticulous detail that she goes to, it, it just makes me want to just fall over. I mean... The napkins, they're, they're like lay out you know, 10 different colors of napkins that to me, they all look the same. And they're all going to just have spaghetti sauce and, you know, Kool-Aid on them and be thrown in the trash can. It doesn't really matter. To me, it was more about the people and the food. And, it, you know, it was for her too, but she was, she was a woman of detail. But the meticulous planning that went into it, just wow. But when I think about reading back in the Old Testament, you know, the, the parts of the Old Testament that... Well, let's face it, they're not as exciting to read. All the meticulous details that went into the building of the, the sanctuary and the, the, the badger skins and the dye and the, the different types of wood and all the various elements that, that had to be exactly just right in order to build this, this temple here on earth. God cares a lot about the details and things. And it's amazing that God, the same God who knows the number on your head and that knows the number on my head, even though it's a little less than most of you, is the same God who I think knows our hearts and our desires and our wants better than we do. So that when we get to heaven, it's going to be better than we could ever imagine in our wildest dreams because our wildest dreams can't even begin to describe what he's prepared for us. It's going to be absolute 100% bliss. And it says here in Revelation 19, 7, what we should be doing to prepare for him. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. His bride has made herself ready. Be glad, rejoice, for our bridegroom is coming. Revolution 21 2 says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So a lot of these, this imagery around a, a bride adorning herself for the husband, a husband preparing a chamber for the, the bride, and, you know, I don't know a whole lot about the details of this, but just my memory jogs me back. In the, the Jewish customs, the, the bridegroom would go, and he would literally prepare a chamber, a, a, a chamber bedroom that would be all set up for the, the honeymoon and the reception of his new bride. And a lot of detail and a lot of attention went into that. The bride would spend, like they do now, hours on the wedding day preparing themselves and cleansing themselves and putting makeup on and fixing their hair and making sure they're dressed and all the details and everything are just pre precise for this amazing event. Wouldn't it be a shame? Wouldn't it be a shame? This God, who was tempted in every way, just like you and me, yet didn't sin, 
This God who, yet while we were still sinners, died for us. This God who lived 33 and a half years down here, he stepped down from the throne of heaven to walk this dusty, dirty earth. A common man, nothing attractive about him that would make him above anyone else. Washed the feet of the very one who betrayed him. Sweat drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane. Had a crown of thorns bashed into his, his, his head with the blood trickling down. Had a cat of nine tails whipped across his back, pulling the flesh from his back, exposing the muscles and the, 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 the gore and the blood. You just imagine the, the physicality of it. Yet that was nothing compared to the mental anguish that he experienced. The weight of the sins of the world on his shoulders. And then when he, when he finally cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from God in death for a time. Yet that same God, that same Jesus Christ, rose again, walked here, ate, spoke, spent time with people, and rose up in the clouds to heaven to prepare a place for you and me with the promise that he will return. Wouldn't it be a shame if after all that he's done for you and all that he's done for me, if when he comes again, we were among those who he said, I never knew you. Now don't get me wrong. There is nothing. There is nothing that you and I can do to earn heaven. Amen? Every single person in this room is unworthy in and of ourselves. Yet we have that high priest. We have a Savior. We have a Redeemer who happens to also be our Creator, who happens to also call us brother and friend, who's going to come back. And He loves us. He loves us. Wouldn't it be sad if we weren't ready for Him when He comes? It doesn't matter what you've done, friends. It doesn't matter where you are right now. God will accept you. He loves you. He has already paid the price. You may wrestle with some of the things that, on that list that I gave earlier. Okay? Statistics would say that most of us wrestle with even some of the most disturbing things I shared with you. Those dark secrets that we're, we, only we know about. God knows about them. Yet while we were still sinners, he died for us. Just ask uh, your, you and, and myself here. It says, prepare our hearts to receive this gift. God loves you. Jesus loves you. No matter what you have done in the past, he loves you and will take you as you are. But the beauty about God's love is that not only will he take you right where you're at, but he, his love for you is so great that he won't leave you there. Like a good coach, he'll pick you up, he'll dust you off, he'll give you direction, he'll give you a slap on the butt and say, get back in there and keep going. Like Pastor Zach shared at the beginning of the sermon today, I think it was, I think it was you, he said, you just, just keep walking, right? One of the key components to the Christian life, whether you're on the, on the high mountaintop experience or in, you're in the low valley, keep walking. Put one foot in front of the other. And when you fall, I'm, I'm going I'm to share with this last little story. Because you will fall, we will fall. But if we're holding on to the hand of Christ, he will pull us out of the muck and mire. And I say my, my brother gave a sermon one time. I, I didn't even have this in my notes, but I'm going to share this with you because it's, it's worth a closing thought. The difference between, between a true Christian and someone else is similar to the difference between a cat and a pig. The difference between a cat and a pig. The cat would represent the true Christian, and the pig would represent someone who's not a true Christian. And we're going to have a big mud puddle in here, and this big mud puddle, the mucky, you know, deep, the kind of mud that you step into and it sucks your shoe off. You know what I'm talking about? They don't have that here in Arizona. In the Midwest, mud gets that way. Here in Arizona, just, yeah, maybe they do, I don't know. So if a cat walks into a, a mud puddle, what does a cat do? It tries to get out, right? A cat tries to get out of that mud. 
picks its paw up and flicks the dirt off and picks the other one up and flicks it off and it, it, it high toes it out of there, right? And it gets to the side and it cleans itself off and it walks around, gets, gets out of there, right? That, that's what a true Christian should do. When we, when we find ourselves engulfed in a sinful experience in life, we should be like that cat and shake it off, get out, clean it, clean it up and keep going. And like Pastor Zach said, keep walking. But then there's the pig, the swine, the hog, right? Gets in that big old pile of mud, deep, all the way up to the belly, and it's sin. And the pig is just like, say, say it again. He's like, oh yeah. He's like, gets down in there, rolls on his back, shakes around, gets his head down in there, and just, just basks in the moment. Loves it, Okay. Instead of getting out and high-stepping it out, he sinks deep and he cherishes every gritty, slimy moment and he doesn't want to leave. Be the cat. When you're in that muck and the mire, maybe it's too deep and you can't get out, you know, reach that little paw up, shake the mud off and grab the hand of Christ Jesus, your Savior. And I guarantee he will pull you out. Don't let go. When Jesus comes again, there's going to be some who are holding on to sin. And there's going to be some that are holding on to Jesus. you got to decide what it is that you want to hold on to. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you so much. But Lord, our love is so lacking. Your love for us is so much higher, so much greater, so much more complete. And we're thankful for that. Uh, we're thankful for the fact that you give us your word. And in your word it says that while we were still yet sinners, you died for us. And it was only your, through your death that we can inherit the kingdom of heaven. And Lord, we're looking forward to that day when you come again. And in the meantime, help us to keep on walking. Help us to put one step in front of the other. And Lord, when the mud puddles come and the sin surrounds us, help us to high step it out of there. And we just pray that you'll clean us off again, dust us off, give us that slap on the behind and tell us to keep going. And uh, we're thankful that not only will you do that, but you'll walk right along our side and be our strength. And uh, we're thankful for that, Lord. As we leave here today, I pray that we will be a light to this dark world and that when you do come again, you'll look at each one of us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.